Okay. So Pat, we are going to start this chapter, chapter 15, knitting, on page 166. So turn the page. We're actually going to skip the first few paragraphs uh, because they're not really pertinent to um, this chapter and we, we need to make some progress here. So please know that you're welcome to go back and read these if you're concerned that you might miss something, but you can also trust me that I know that I mean, you're gonna be just fine if you don't. So page 166, we are starting about two thirds down the page with the paragraph that begins a suspended interest. And so, not their original interest, as the small coinage of humanity from whose ragged pockets they had come. Okay, now we're ready. A suspended interest and a prevalent absence of mind were perhaps observed by the spies who looked in at the wine shop, as they looked in at every place, high and low, from the king's palace to the criminal's jail. Games at cards languished, players at dominoes musingly built towers with them, drinkers drew figures on the tables with spilt drops of wine. Madame Dufage herself picked out the pattern on her sleeve with her toothpick and saw and heard something inaudible and invisible a long way off. So you should be underlining saw and heard something inaudible and invisible a long way off. So we're picking up in the wine shop and this is Madame Dufarge. You can write this little note. I wrote it right there beside the red that I underlined. She's dreaming of a revolution. So when she's daydreaming in this wine shop, she is just, she can even hear the sounds that it's going to sound like when finally this revolution begins. So you know chapter 14 that you're reading for homework is called The Honest Tradesman. So who's that about? Jerry. Jerry, good job. And that takes place in England. So see, you're not missing anything from 14 that has to be known today for chapter 15. So chapter 14 is super important for what happens in the future. So you do need to read it. All right, so in the wine shop in Paris, you'll see that Mr. Defarge has been away for several days. Today, in book time, he's coming home. And so there are a lot of customers in the wine shop. Some of them are just ordinary customers that don't know of any activity, covert activity that takes place in the wine shop. Several are there because they are some of those shocks they're sympathetic to the cause and they want to be part of the coming revolution. A lot of them are there because they have gotten news through the grapevine that Gaspard has been arrested finally for killing the Marquis. Oh, no. It's been a year book time since the Marquis was killed. And so Gaspard was able to elude the authorities for maybe nine, 10, or 11 months, but they have received word that he's been arrested. So there are lots of people in the wine shop to hear the news. And then finally, there are also spies in the wine shop because they know the authorities now that Gaspard has killed the Marquis, and Gaspard is from this neighborhood in Paris. So lots of intrigue going on, and the wine shop is full of activity, and then Madame de Barge is daydreaming about the coming revolution. Okay, now, red pen in your hand, please. St. Antoine, in this vinous feature of his, until midday. It was high noontide when two dusty men passed through his streets and under his swinging lamps, of whom one was Monsieur Defarge, the other a mender of Rome in a blue cap. All a dust and a thirst, the two entered the wine shop. They arrived. So, Mr. Defarge has been away for several days, and he actually went to see 
he was on his way to try to see and visit with Gaspard and then to do something else once he found out that Gaspard needed help. So uh, on his way back to Paris, he brought with him the Mender of Rhodes. What do we remember about the Mender of Rhodes? He has a blue cap, that's gonna be important. Uh, later on, his cap color is gonna change, but right now it's blue. What do we know about him? We met him in chapter eight. Can you write chapter eight? Right on that above, at the very top of the page, above the Mender of Rhodes, write chapter eight. What did he do in chapter eight? Mend Rhodes. He had a conversation with the Marquis. Oh, didn't he tell him Gaspar was underneath the chair? Yes, thank you. Somebody. Boom. Okay. Well, no, okay. no, no. So, um, so the Mender of Roads did tell the Marquis that there was a man hanging underneath his carriage, and this man was not from around there. Okay, so that's the Mender of Roads. And now he has a lot of information to tell because he's from the Marquis territory and knows what's happened. Okay, rest him. Kind of fire in the breast of Saint Antoine, fast spreading as they came along, which stirred and flickered in flames of faces at most doors and windows. Yet no one had followed them, and no man spoke when they entered the wine shop, though the eyes of every man there were turned upon them. Good day, gentlemen said Monsieur Dufage. It may have been a signal for loosening the general tongue. It elicited an answer in chorus of good day. It is bad weather, gentlemen, said Dufage, shaking his head, upon which every man looked at his neighbor and then all cast down their eyes and sat silent, except, except one, one man who got up and went out. out. Now, Mr. Dufage just said, oh, it's bad weather out there. And on his saying that, lots of people in the wine shop look down and they're sad because they know that Mr. Defarge has bad news. Now, I need you to put a red bracket around the next paragraph that we're about to read. Control, red bracket around the yeah. next paragraph there. And then I want you to put a superscript one at the end of the paragraph right by the word my wife okay. and then we'll explain in a minute my wife said defarge aloud addressing madame defarge i have traveled certain leagues with this good mender of roads called jacques i met him by accident a day and a half's journey out of paris he is a good child this mender of roads called jacques give him to drink my wife okay so Mr. Defarge is letting all of the sympathizers in the wine shop know this guy's one of us, right? Because he's introducing him as shocked. And so um, he, here's what you write on the side of your page. This is the only note on the side. So however much room you want to write to it is fine. It's superscript one right here. In code language, Mr. Defarge tells that he has recruited a new shock. So in code language, Mr. Defarge tells that he's recruited a new shock. And I will know that you are finished when you pick up your red pen because we have some more underlining to do on this starting with that next sentence a second man got up and went out because he knows the code language very well a second man got up and went out madame defarge set wine before the mender of roads called jacques who doffed his blue cap to the company and drank in the breast of his blouse, he carried some coarse, dark bread. He ate of this between whiles and sat munching and drinking near Madame Defarge's counter. A third, a third man got up, got up and went out. Went out. Defarge refreshed himself with a draught of wine, but he took less than was given to the stranger, as being himself a man to whom it was no rarity, and stood waiting until the countryman had made his breakfast. 
He looked at no one present, and no one now looked at him, not even Madame Defarge, who had taken up her knitting and was at work. Have you finished your repast, friend? He asked in due season. Yes, thank you. Come then. You shall see the apartment that I told you you could occupy. It will suit you to a marvel. Out of the wine shop into the street, out of the street into a courtyard, out of the courtyard up a steep staircase, out of the staircase into a garret, formerly the garret where a white-haired man sat on a low bench, stooping forward and very busy, making shoes. Okay, do y'all remember that when we first went to the wine shop, many chapters ago, that Dr. Manette was being oh, held way up there on the fifth floor in that tiny little attic room called the garret. Okay, but, and I would not fault you if you did not remember this. Do you remember that when Mr. Lori and Lucy and Defarge got to that fifth floor, that there were three men? You do remember mm -hmm. this? And those three men were peeking through the little hole to see Mr. Um, Dr. Manette, these are the same three men that just got up one at a time and went up there to the little attic where the Mender of Rose is going to be staying. It will be important. No white-haired man was there now, but the three men were there who had gone out of the wine shop singly, and between them and the white-haired man afar off was the one small link that they had once looked in at him through the chinks in the wall. Defarge closed the door carefully and spoke in a subdued voice. Jacques one, Jacques two, Jacques three. This is the witness encountered by appointment by me, Jacques four. He will tell you all. Speak, Jacques five. Okay, so you actually need to circle. I had you undermine it, but I really want you to circle Jacques one, Jacques two, Jacques three. And then in the line above it, like in the space above it, you need to write this note, that these three shops, one, two, three, are the inner circle. They make up the inner circle of advisors. You will see shop one, two, three for the rest of the book. They're kind of like nothing happens without their approval. Now, shop. Mr. Defarge does refer to himself, I think, as Jacques Ford here. That's never going to be important. You'll never be tested about that on a test. But you will be tested about Jacques 1, 2, and 3. One of those numbers is going to be very, very important. And we will begin to see that easily in this chapter. So now pick up your green pen. And I want you to write a note for the rest of this page because the vendor of roads is about to tell this little inner circle what has happened in great detail to Gaspard. So you're writing this note right here. Mender of roads tells what happens when Gaspard is captured. The mender of roads, blue cap in hand, wiped his swarthy forehead with it, and said, Where shall I commence, monsieur? Commence, was monsieur Defarge's not unreasonable reply, at the commencement. I saw him then, messieurs, began the mender of roads, a year ago this running summer, underneath the carriage of the Marquis, hanging by the chain. Behold the manner of it. I leaving my work on the road, the sun going to bed, the carriage of the Marquis slowly ascending the hill, he hanging by the chain, like this. Again, the mender of roads went through the whole performance, in which he ought to have been perfect by that time, seeing that it had been the infallible resource and indispensable entertainment of his village during a whole year. Jacques Wan struck in and asked if he had ever seen the man before. Never, answered the mender of roads, recovering his perpendicular. Jacques III demanded how he afterwards recognized him then. By his tall figure, said the mender of roads, softly, and with his finger at his nose. When Monsieur the Marquis demands that evening, say what he is like, I make response, tall as a spectre. You should have said, short as a dwarf, returned Jacques II. But what did I know? The deed was not then accomplished. Neither did he confide in me. 
Observe, under those circumstances even, I do not offer my testimony. Monsieur the Marquis indicates me with his finger, standing near our little fountain, and says, to me, bring that rascal. My faith, monsieur, I offer nothing. He is right there, Jacques, murmured Defarge to him who had interrupted. Go on. Good, said the mender of roads, with an air of mystery. The tall man is lost, and he is sought. How many months? Nine? Ten? Eleven? No matter the number, said Defarge. He is well hidden, but at last he is unluckily found. Go on. I am again at work upon the hillside, and the sun is again about to go to bed. I am collecting my tools to descend to my cottage down in the village below, where it is already dark, when I raise my eyes and see coming over the hill six soldiers. In the midst of them is a tall man with his arms bound, tied to his sides, like this. With the aid of his indispensable cap, he represented a man with his elbows bound fast at his hips, with cords that were knotted behind him. I stand aside, messieurs, by my heap of stones, to see the soldiers and their prisoner pass, for it is a solitary road that, where any spectacle is well worth looking at. And at first, as they approach, I see no more than that they are six soldiers with a tall man bound, and that they are almost black to my sight, except on the side of the sun going to bed, where they have a red edge, messieurs. Also, I see that their long shadows are on the hollow ridge on the opposite side of the road, and are on the hill above it, and are like the shadows of giants. Also, I see that they are covered with dust, and that the dust moves with them as they come, tramp, tramp. But when they advance quite near to me, I recognize the tall man, and he recognizes me. Ah, but he would be well content to precipitate himself over the hillside once again, as on the evening when he and I first encountered, close to the same spot. He described it as if he were there, and it was evident that he saw it vividly. Perhaps he had not seen much in his life. I do not show the soldiers that I recognize the tall man. He does not show the soldiers that he recognizes me. We do it, and we know it with our eyes. Come on, says the chief of that company, pointing to the village. Bring him fast to his tomb, and they bring him faster. I follow. His arms are swelled because of being bound so tight. His wooden shoes are large and clumsy, and he is lame. Because he is lame, and consequently slow, they drive him with their guns, like this. He imitated the action of a man's being impelled forward by the butt ends of muskets. As they descend the hill like madmen running a race, he falls. They laugh and pick him up again. His face is bleeding and covered with dust, but he cannot touch it. Thereupon they laugh again. They bring him into the village. All the village runs to look. They take him past the mill and up to the prison. All the village sees the prison gate open in the darkness of the night and swallow him like this. He opened his mouth as wide as he could, and shut it with a sounding snap of his teeth. Observant of his unwillingness to mar the effect by opening it again, Dufarge said, Go on, Jacques. All the village, pursued the mender of roads, on tiptoe and in a low voice, withdraws. All the village whispers by the fountain. All the village sleeps. All the village dreams of that unhappy one within the locks and bars of the prison on the crag, and never to come out of it, except to perish. In the morning, with my tools upon my shoulder, eating my morsel of black bread as I go, I make a circuit by the prison on my way to my work. There I see him high up behind the bars of a lofty iron cage, bloody and dusty as last night, looking through. He has no hand free to wave to me. I dare not call to him. He regards me like a dead man. Dufarge and the three glanced darkly at one another. The looks of all of them were dark, repressed, and revengeful as they listened to the countryman's story. Okay, so that's what you need to underline. We're at the bottom of page 170. Defarge and the three glanced darkly at one another. The looks of all of them were dark, repressed, and revengeful as they listened to the countryman's story. Put a superscript one after the word story. Then at the top of your page, you are going to write with your green pen that note in brown at the top of page 171. They all loved Gaspard. Every one of these members of the inner circle knew him well as a friend. They all loved Gaspard. So this story incites their anger and desire for vengeance. I will know you're finished when you pick up your red pen because in this paragraph, 
is something very important that we need to underline in red. while in secret, once authoritative too. They had the air of a rough tribunal. Jacques one and two, sitting on the old pallet bed, each with his chin resting on his hand, and his eyes intent on the road mender. Jacques three, equally intent, on one knee behind them, with his agitated hand always gliding over the network of fine nerves about his mouth and nose. Dufarge, standing between them and the narrator, whom he had stationed in the light of the window, by turns looking from him to them and from them to him. Go on, Jacques, said Defarge. Okay, so now uh, with your red pen, we're going back up to that same paragraph we were working with a while ago. And about five lines from the bottom, you're going to underline Jacques three. Do you see him? Jacques three. In the line below, you're going to underline with his agitated hand always gliding over the network of fine nerves about his mouth and nose. And so then we will talk more about that later, but this is the most important shock three in every single time throughout the rest of this book, and he has many appearances. Um, shock three will always Either the verb or the adjective or even the noun will emphasize that his hand is near his mouth. And there's a very particular reason for that, as you will see. Uh, okay, I can wait on that note. All right, red pen still. He remains up there in his iron cage some days. The village looks at him by stealth, for it is afraid. But it always looks up from a distance at the prison on the crag. And in the evening, when the work of the day is achieved, and it assembles to gossip at the fountain, all faces are turned towards the prison. Formerly, they were turned towards the posting house. Now, they are turned towards the prison. They whisper at the fountain that although condemned to death, he will not be executed. They say that petitions have been presented in Paris, showing that he was enraged and made mad by the death of his child. They say that a petition has been presented to the king himself. What do I know? It is possible, perhaps yes, perhaps no. Listen then, Jacques, number one of that name sternly interposed. Know that a petition was presented to the king and queen. All here, yourself accepted, saw the king take it in his carriage in the street, sitting beside the queen. It is Dufarge, whom you see here, who, at the hazard of his life, darted out before the horses with the petition in his hand. Finish that sentence. Underline all of that sentence ending with in his hand and put a superscript to. This is telling us that when Mr. Defarge really went to investigate because he heard that Gaspard had been captured, somewhere along there he ran into the mender of roads who told about, yeah, he's in, he's in prison. They had a, not a prison like we would know but actually just a cage taller than a person sitting down. So it's a very small cage for a human, a large cage for an animal maybe, um, that he is, that's the prison, just this cage. And you guys were in there? Yes. I mean, it could be, could be Sitting, oh. yeah, it's just sitting. And so when Mr. Defarge finds out that Gaspard is in this cage and that they're about to kill him, Defarge risks his life to put a petition. First of all, he gathers signatures and he comes up with a petition that has so many signatures and he presents it to the king. Where would he meet the king? Well, I'm glad you asked because every Sunday in this time period in France, in England, probably in all countries that had a monarch, 
there would be a weekly parade on Sunday through the streets to give the opportunity to the king and queen to show off their fine clothes and all of their pomp and circumstance, if you will. And so Defarge runs out and stops the horses to put this petition in the hands of the king. The king did not kill the, uh, Defarge for stopping this, interrupting the parade, but he did have him severely beaten. And so I want you to write this green note right here uh, on the side of your book. And then I want you to write the superscript three note, though you haven't been told superscript three. I want you to write this short note at the bottom of the page. In my book, I have a longer note, but I abbreviated Destin so that it wouldn't be too much writing for you. Pick up your pen and start writing. You're writing this note right here on the side, dear, and this one at the bottom. So Defarge risked his life in presenting the petition to the king. That's how much he loves Gaspard in this whole inner circle. Gaspard was really close with him. So that's why Defarge risks his life. And then uh, at the bottom, you can write superscript three, the king has Defarge beaten. But before we really find out that superscript three in text, there's much more about Jacques three. And so you're going to see possibly why he's important. Maybe it's the next page. Again, listen, Jacques, said the kneeling number three, his fingers ever wandering over and over those fine nerves with a strikingly greedy air, as if he hungered for something that was neither food nor drink. The guard, horse, and foot surrounded the petitioner and struck him blows. You hear? Okay, so underline with your red pen, surrounded the petitioner and struck him blows, superscript three. Did you get that? Now, in that same paragraph, did any of you notice that this guy, Jacques Three, has a very different voice, a unique voice? And our narrator does just such a fabulous professional job giving him this, what I think is a very uh, greedy voice, maybe. So I want you to go back in this paragraph and circle three, the word three, that's in the second line, circle three. Then in the line below, circle greedy, circle hungered, and then circle in the line below, neither food nor drink. So this Jacques three is very greedy, but not for something that's food or drink. And yet his mouth is always going to be emphasized. Um, and so we're wondering, I'm sure we're all wondering, what, what is his for? Okay, turn, uh, we're almost ready to turn the page. Red pen. Yeah, messieurs. Go on then, said Defarge. Again, on the other hand, they whisper at the fountain, resumed the countryman, that he is brought down into our country to be executed on the spot, and that he will very certainly be executed. They even whisper that because he has slain Monseigneur, and because Monseigneur was the father of his tenants, serfs, what you will, he will be executed as a parasite. Parasite superscript one. So you're actually going to underline, because he has slain, we're talking about Gaspard, because he has slain Monseigneur. Monseigneur, who do we mean? Um, Who did he kill? Mar the Marquis. The Marquis, that's right. And because Monseigneur was the father of his tenants, are you underlining? <coughs> Serfs? Parasite. Well, they're saying that because um, Gaspard killed the Marquis, he's going to be charged with the crime of parasite. So I bet we need to know what is parasite. Well, parasite, oh, that that superscript one, parasite is the killing of one's father. Now what? Gaspard lived in Paris. The Marquis lives in the country. Was the Marquis 
Gaspard's father? Certainly not. So why would Gaspard be charged with killing his father? Because, because the marquis in the country owns all this property and the people on it. So if Gaspard, who lives in Paris, is visiting the country and kills the marquis, they're charging him with killing his father as if it were his biological Because the marquis owns that land that. Like, and this, everybody this his daughter. Exactly. Not more. Oh, there's hope for you after all. What that mean? No. <laughs> you, you got, you got <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So on the on the side of your book, you already have that top note, right? Or do you? Did I tell you to put it up here? No? Okay. So everybody, if I didn't, Please write superscript one. No, Archer, you're not fussing at her, are you? No. No. Be a boy. All right. So now put this note on the side of your book. It's a long one. Wait, I'm on the wrong page. This one over here. Put it down the side. The punishment was barbaric in its brutality. But the nobility considered the brutal executions great sport. And you're about to first you read on the side of the page. Thank you. You are about to first read this horribly barbaric punishment they did to a different person who was accused of parasite. Okay. And then we will find out what they do to Gaspard. So write that note, and while you're writing that, I'm going to play some more audio. One old man says at the fountain that his right hand, armed with the knife, will be burnt off before his face, that into wounds which will be made in his arms, his breast, and his legs, there will be poured boiling oil, melted lead, hot resin, wax, and sulfur. Finally, that he will be torn limb from limb by four strong horses. That old man says all this was actually done to a prisoner who made an attempt on the life of the late King Louis XV. But how do I know if he lies? I am not a scholar. Listen once again then, Jacques, said the man with the restless hand and the craving air. The name of that prisoner was Damien, and it was all done in open day in the open streets of this city of Paris, and nothing was more noticed in the vast concourse that saw it done than the crowd of ladies of quality and fashion who were full of eager attention to the last. To the last, Jacques, prolonged until nightfall, when he had lost two legs and an arm and still breathed. And it was done. Why, how old are you? 35, said the mender of roads, who looked 60. It was done when you were more than 10 years old. You might have seen it. Enough, said Defarge, with grim impatience. Long live the devil, go on. Well, some whisper this, some whisper that. They speak of nothing else. Even the fountain appears to fall to that tune. At length, on Sunday night, when all the villagers are asleep, come soldiers winding down from the prison, and their guns ring on the stones of the little street. Workmen dig, workmen hammer, soldiers laugh and sing. In the morning, by the fountain, there is raised a gallows 40 feet high, poisoning the water. So what that means, poisoning the water is, you're going to hang someone. You're going to hang someone right over the well where everyone has to come get their water, as you will see. Before we leave this page, can you look about in the middle of the page and find the French name? In English country, it looks like it would be Damien's, but it's Damien or something like that. Put Damien, underline it, superscript two. And then we'll be done with that page, and poor Gaspard is about to meet his end. The mender of roads looked through rather than at the low ceiling, and pointed as if he saw the gallows somewhere in the sky. All work is stopped, all assemble there, nobody leads the cows out, the cows are there with the rest. At midday the roll of drums, soldiers have marched into the prison in the night, and he is in the midst of many soldiers. He is bound as before, and in his mouth there is a gag tied.
tied so with a tight string, making him look almost as if he laughed. He suggested it by creasing his face with his two thumbs from the corners of his mouth to his ears. On the top of the gallows is fixed the knife, blade upwards, with its point in the air. He is hanged there 40 feet high and his left hanging, poisoning the water. They looked at one another as he used his blue cap to wipe his face, on which the perspiration had started afresh, while he recalled the spectacle. It is frightful, messieurs. How can the women and the children draw water? Who can gossip of an evening under that shadow? Under it, have I said, when I left the village, Monday evening as the sun was going to bed, and looked back from the hill, the shadows struck across the church, across the mill, across the prison, seemed to strike across the earth, messieurs to where the sky rests upon it. The hungry man gnawed one of his fingers as he looked at the other three, and his finger his quivered with the craving that was on him. craving that was on him, and circle the word craving. Which shock is this? Three. Three, yes, don't forget this, because this will be on every quiz, test, final exam, etc. So right here is where you need to write with your green pen, and because of this super long note that's going to take the top and the sides, I think you should try to squeeze this shock three note in between paragraphs. So you're writing hunger for, remember, it's not food or drink he's craving and hungry for. It's for justice and revolution. And we're going to see this time and time again in the book. Because, you know, many times they, this inner circle will be meeting and they'll be trying to decide, do we kill this person? That's because the person doesn't really deserve to be killed. Uh, do we kill this person or do we just throw him in prison for 30 years? And shot three is always going to say, kill him, you know, because he's craving. He's the most bloodthirsty of the three and always wants the most violence that can come from the situation. Now, buckle your seat belts because this is so cool. Thank you. Yes. I left at sunset as I had been warned to do and I walked on that night and half next day until I met as I was warned I should this comrade. With him I came on, now riding and now walking, through the rest of yesterday and through last night. And here you see me. After a gloomy silence, the first Jacques said, Good, you have acted and recounted faithfully. Will you wait for us a little outside the door? Very willingly, said the mender of roads, whom Defarge escorted to the top of the stairs, and leaving seated there, returned. The three had risen and their heads were together when he came back to the garret. How say you, Jacques, demanded number one, to be registered? To be registered as doomed to, to destruction, to returned to the farm. Magnet, oh. efficient, croaked the man with the craving. Do you see? That's which Jacques? Three. Which Jacques is saying that. Yes, three is correct. And you underlined, right, doomed to destruction? E. Okay. Here we go, pay attention. Chateau and all the race, inquired the first. The chateau, the chateau 
and all the rest return to Defarge. Extermination. Okay, so this is the verdict of the inner circle. De doomed to destruction. So right here, I guess you could write it anywhere because it's the only note on the page, but you're writing this note. This note. All the members of the family, all the relatives, all descendants. Descendants of whose family? The Marquis, the rich, the rich, the, the rich people. Yes. The Marquis, all of his descendants. Do we know a descendant? Yeah, Darnay. And anyone that Darnay marries? Anyone? Any children born to? Do they know Darnay school. Like, right? Descendants. Do they know Darnay school? Are they gonna kill him? Because he's not even black daddy. He's on the list, <laughs> right? Registered as doomed to destruction, total extermination. Even a baby? Yeah. They. You <laughs> know, in real life, historically, they killed a lot of children. We're gonna see. I'm sorry to tell you that when the revolution starts, it doesn't matter if you're child, baby. If you're rich or belong to a rich family, that's your crime. Okay. They don't know no better. They don't even know nothing about that. Uh, it doesn't matter. You're used to America, where we might factor in factors like that, but that's not the way of. Oh my God. Not that it always happens in America, but okay. So here we go. This is not even the best part. Hang on. Red pen. The man repeated in a rapturous croak, magnificent, and began gnawing another finger. Are you sure, asked Jacques too of Defarge, that no embarrassment can arise from our manner of keeping the register? Without doubt it is safe, for no one beyond ourselves can decipher it. But shall we always be able to decipher it? Or, I ought to say, will she? She. she. Okay, Who's so this? Jacques too says, are we going to get in trouble if that if the registry is discovered? Like, will we will we be able to read the registry? That's what Jacques too is wondering. Red pen in hand for this wonderful paragraph. Ah, returned to Farge, drawing himself up. If Madame, my wife, undertook to keep the register in her memory alone, she would not lose a word of it, not a syllable of it. Knitted in her own stitches and her own symbols, it will always be as plain to her as the sun. Confide in Madame Dufage. It would be easier for the weakest poltroon that lives to erase himself from existence than to erase one letter of his name or crimes from the knitted register of Madame Dufage. Okay, so underline that sentence too. It would be easier for the weakest poltroon, that word means coward, that lives to erase himself from existence than to erase one letter of his name or crimes from the knitted register of the Dr. Farge. Now, we saw in a couple of chapters previously, Madame de Farge symbolizes which characters from mythology? The three sisters. What are the fates. The fates. Remember, one, one spins the thread of one life. One measures it measures. and one cuts it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so she represents the fates. And so the knitting, it turns out what she's knitting. Who crochets in here? Does anybody crochet or you have a relative? So you know what I'm talking I'm about? You, do you know enough to know, Ethan and Liz, that I'm there are many knitting. different stitches yes. that people use? Okay, so Madame de Farge has one stitch that corresponds to each letter of the alphabet. So all this time where she looks like she's harmlessly she writing notes. She is recording names, descriptions physically, as we see in chapter 16. Descriptions, the, the details That's of the hard. crime they hard. committed. And yeah. so this means that that, that registry 
that's pretty safe. And you'll find out later, she's training a bunch of other women to do with the secret code of the registry so that what looks like just a harmless afghan or a blanket or whatever scarf is actually someone's death sentence so this is the significance one of the many reasons you want to forget about the college. and now after you get this very long note written on page Whatever that is, I can't even read it. Yeah, thank you. 173. Get this note started at the top, and when I check your book to see that it's written, it's about to be written. some of the Wait. slappers what in here. Do we write it? 73? Yes. You have it? You write it on 73? What about, I don't think you could have gotten it all up there. Because I write smaller than you, and it took me. Three lines at the top and two at the side.